Hello and welcome to Reading with Carrie, Stories to Fall Asleep to, a mindfulness podcast series that can be used as a sleep aid or to ease your anxiety and relieve your stress. I am your host, Carrie Favel, and I am so thankful that you've decided to spend some time with me. Today's episode has the theme of pig. While we might consider the animal of a pig as being dirty, they're actually really intelligent. And this also kind of goes through with the sign of pig. Pigs are diligent, compassionate, and generous. They have great concentration, and once they set a goal, they will devote all their energy to achieving it. Though pigs rarely seek help from others, they will not refuse to give others a hand. However, pigs never suspect trickery, so they are easily fooled. Today's validation space comes from Dwarak Peck, link in the description. And this is a fact, not necessarily a myth. One in five Americans has experienced some form of mental illness, with one in 25 experiencing serious mental illness, such as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. I just want you to sit with that for a moment. Consider yourself in a classroom. Now, depending on the size of classes in your education system, you can have up to 20 to 30 students in one class. I think they do try to cut it off at 25. Sometimes you get lucky and you have 13, but you definitely have 10. So that means two people in that one classroom of 10 experienced some sort of mental illness. And in a college course or in a larger classroom, at least one person in that room is experiencing a very serious mental illness. I used to work for a company that had about 200 employees. That kind of puts it in perspective when you think that 40 people in that office were experiencing mental issues and eight people were really truly suffering. And before we begin, let's start with a brief mindfulness exercise. Close your eyes and take a posture that is relaxed, taking care to keep your back and neck in alignment. As you get situated, really notice your body, feeling the weight of your body on the chair, the bed, the floor, or wherever you may be in this moment. Notice the position of your feet and any sensations you can feel with them. Locate your legs and the blunt pressure on whatever seat you are on. Feel any sensations in your arms and make sure your shoulders are soft. Where are your hands resting? What are they feeling? Acknowledge any tension that you feel in your muscles and allow your body to express itself, being present in the moment. Just be aware of the tension or whatever may be happening in your body. Simply note the communication with a simple thought of, I hear you, that's how it is right now. Bring your focus to your breath, but don't alter it in any way. Just feel your body's natural rhythm as you inhale and exhale. Feel the oxygen enter your lungs, that slight hitch between inhale and exhale, and the sensation of the air exiting your lungs with another micro moment between breaths. Let's extend our awareness to our mind. What thoughts or feelings or perceptions are present right now? Again, we are just noting these thoughts and feelings in this moment. Don't try to push or shut down any sense of discomfort or unpleasant feelings, but don't dwell on them either. Simply validate them with a simple acknowledgement, such as, that's okay, that's how it is right now. Keeping the connection you have with your body, reach your hands above your head, stretching your arms. Tense up the muscles as you breathe in and hold them in place for just a moment. And now, as you release the breath, relax your muscles and place your arms back to where they were resting comfortably before. Let's repeat this once more. Raising your hands above your head, tense your muscles in your arms and shoulders as you breathe in and hold the position as you hold your breath for just a short count of four. 
Then release your breath as you release your muscles and rest your arms back to where they were. Now focus back to your breathing and notice how you can relax by taking slow, deep breaths in and releasing your breath slowly out. Breathe in, hold your breath, and breathe out slowly. Breathe in and out. Keep breathing deeply, gently, and slowly. Now, notice your whole body as being present. Be aware of every part at once, as best you can, as you continue to softly and deeply breathe in and out. If you are preparing yourself for bed, continue to breathe in and out, and just listen to my voice, but do not follow. If you need to ready yourself to get back to your day, then let us now widen our spatial awareness by using our other senses. What sounds do you hear in the room other than my voice? Are there any smells you can recognize? Feel the item on which you are resting with all of your body and imagine it in your mind. Try to picture it as accurately as you can without opening your eyes just yet. And now, take a deep breath in on an inhale of four. Hold your breath for a count of four. And on an audible sigh, release your breath as you open your eyes and fully come back. And now, here's the story. The Enchanted Pig by Petra Ispirescu. Once upon a time, there lived a king who had three daughters. Now it happened that he had to go out to battle, so he called his daughters and said to them, My dear children, I am obliged to go to war. The enemy is approaching us with a large army. It is a great grief to me to leave you all. During my absence, take care of yourselves and be good girls. Behave well and look after everything in the house. You may walk in the garden and you may go into all the rooms in the palace, except the room at the back in the right-hand corner. Into that you must not enter, for harm would befall you. You may keep your mind easy, father, they replied. We have never been disobedient to you. Go in peace, and may heaven give you a glorious victory. When everything was ready for his departure, the king gave them the keys of all the rooms and reminded them once more of what he had said. His daughters kissed his hands with tears in their eyes and wished him prosperity, and he gave the eldest the keys. Now when the girls found themselves alone, they felt so sad and dull that they did not know what to do. So, to pass the time, they decided to work for part of the day, to read for part of the day, and to enjoy themselves in the garden for part of the day. As long as they did this, all went well with them, but this happy state of things did not last long. Every day they grew more and more curious, and you will see what the end of that was. Sisters, said the eldest princess, all day we sew, spin, and read. We have been several days quite alone, and there is no corner of the garden that we have not explored. We have been in all the rooms of our father's palace and have admired the rich and beautiful furniture. Why should not we go into the room that our father forbade us to enter? Sister, said the youngest, I cannot think how you can tempt us to break our father's command. When he told us not to go into that room, he must have known what he was saying and have had a good reason for saying it. Surely the sky won't fall about our heads if we do go in, said the second princess. Dragons and such like monsters that would devour us will not be hidden in the room. How will our father ever find out that we have gone in? While they were speaking thus, encouraging each other, they had reached the room. The eldest fitted the key into the lock, and snap, the door stood open. The three girls entered, and what do you think they saw? The room was quite empty and without any ornament but in the middle stood a large table with a gorgeous cloth, and on it lay a big open book. Now the princesses were curious to know what was written in the book, especially the eldest, and this is what she read. The eldest daughter of this king will marry a prince from the east. Then the second girl stepped forward, and turning over the page she read, The second daughter of this king will marry a prince from the west. The girls were delighted and laughed and teased each other, but the youngest princess did not want to go near the table or to open the book. Her elder sisters, however, left her no peace, and will she, nil she, they dragged her up to the table, and in fear and trembling, she turned over the page and read, The youngest daughter of this king will be married to a pig from the north. Now if a thunderbolt had fallen upon her from heaven, it would not have frightened her more. 
She almost died of misery, and if her sisters had not held her up, she would have sunk to the ground and cut her head open. When she came out of the fainting fit, into which she had fallen in her terror, her sisters tried to comfort her, saying, How can you believe such nonsense? When did it ever happen that a king's daughter married a pig? What a baby you are, said the other sister. Has not our father enough soldiers to protect you, even if the disgusting creature did come to woo you? The youngest princess would fain have let herself be convinced by her sister's words and have believed what they said, but her heart was heavy. Her thoughts kept turning to the book, in which stood written that great happiness waited her sisters, but that a fate was in store for her such as had never before been known in the world. Besides, the thought weighed on her heart that she had been guilty of disobeying her father. She began to get quite ill, and in a few days she was so changed that it was difficult to recognize her. Formerly, she had been rosy and merry. Now she was pale, and nothing gave her any pleasure. She gave up playing with her sisters in the garden, ceased to gather flowers to put in her hair, and never sang when they sat together at their spinning and sewing. In the meantime, the king won a great victory, and having completely defeated and driven off the enemy, he hurried home to his daughters, to whom his thoughts had constantly turned. Everyone went out to meet him with cymbals and fifes and drums, and there was great rejoicing over his victorious return. The king's first act on reaching home was to thank heaven for the victory he had gained over the enemies who had risen against him. He then entered his palace, and the three princesses stepped forward to meet him. His joy was great when he saw that they were all well, for the youngest did her best not to appear sad. In spite of this, however, it was not long before the king noticed that his third daughter was getting very thin and sad-looking, and all of a sudden he felt as if a hot iron were entering his soul, for it flashed through his mind that she had disobeyed his word. He felt sure he was right, but to be quite certain, he called his daughters to him, questioned them, and ordered them to speak the truth. They confessed everything, but took good care not to say which had led the other two into temptation. The king was so distressed when he heard it that he was almost overcome by grief, but he took heart and tried to comfort his daughters, who looked frightened to death. He saw that what had happened had happened, and that a thousand words would not alter matters by a hair's breadth. Well, these events had almost been forgotten, when one fine day a prince from the east appeared at the court and asked the king for the hand of the eldest daughter. The king gladly gave his consent. A great wedding banquet was prepared, and after three days of feasting, the happy pair were accompanied to the frontier with much ceremony and rejoicing. After some time, the same thing befell the second daughter, who was wooed and won by a prince from the west. Now when the young princess saw that everything fell out exactly as had been written in the book, she grew very sad. She refused to eat and would not put on her fine clothes nor go out walking, and she declared she would rather die than become a laughingstock to the world. But the king would not allow her to do anything so wrong, and he comforted her in all possible ways. So the time passed till, lo and behold, one fine day, an enormous pig from the north walked into the palace, and going straight up to the king said, Hail, O king, may your life be as prosperous and bright as sunrise on a clear day. I am glad to see you well, friend, answered the king, but what wind has brought you hither? I come a-wooing, replied the pig. Now the king was astonished to hear so fine a speech from a pig, and at once it occurred to him that something strange was the matter. He would gladly have turned the pig's thoughts in another direction, as he did not wish to give him the princess for a wife. But when he heard that the court and the whole street were full of all the pigs in the world, he saw that there was no escape, and that he must give his consent. The pig was not satisfied with mere promises, but insisted that the wedding should take place within a week, and would not go away until the king had sworn a royal oath upon it. The king then sent for his daughter and advised her to submit to fate, as there was nothing else to be done, and he added, My child, the words and whole behavior of this pig are quite unlike those of other pigs. I do not myself believe he was always a pig. Depend upon it some magic or witchcraft has been at work. Obey him and do everything that he wishes, and I feel sure that heaven will shortly send you release. If you wish me to do this, dear father, I will do it, replied the girl. In the meantime, the wedding day drew near. After the marriage, the pig and his bride set out for his home in one of the royal carriages. On the way, they passed a great bog, and the pig ordered the carriage to stop, and got out and rolled about in the mire till he was covered with mud from head to foot. Then he got back into the carriage and told his wife to kiss him. What was the poor girl to do? She bethought herself of her father's words, and, pulling out her pocket handkerchief, she gently wiped the pig's snout and kissed it. By the time they reached the pig's dwelling, which stood in a thick wood, it was quite dark. They sat down quietly for a little, as they were tired after their drive. Then they had supper together, and lay down to rest. During the night, the princess noted that the pig had changed into a man. 
She was not a little surprised, but remembering her father's words, she took courage, determined to wait and see what would happen. And now she noticed that every night the pig became a man, and every morning he was changed into a pig before she awoke. This happened several nights running, and the princess could not understand it at all. Clearly, her husband must be bewitched. In time, she grew quite fond of him. He was so kind and gentle. One fine day, as she was sitting alone, she saw an old witch go past. She felt quite excited, as it was too long since she had seen a human being, and she called out to the old woman to come and talk to her. Among other things, the witch told her that she understood all magic arts, and that she would foretell the future, and knew the healing powers of herbs and plants. I shall be grateful to you all my life, old dame, said the princess, if you will tell me what is the matter with my husband. Why is he a pig by day, and a human being by night? I was just going to tell you that one thing, my dear, to show you what a good fortune teller I am. If you like, I will give you a herb to break the spell. If you will only give it to me, said the princess, I will give you anything you choose to ask for, for I cannot bear to see him in this state. Here then, my dear child, said the witch, take this thread, but do not let him know about it, for if he did, it would lose its healing power. At night, when he is asleep, you must get up very quietly and fasten the thread round his left foot as firmly as possible. And you will see in the morning he will not have changed back into a pig, but will still be a man. I do not want any reward. I shall be sufficiently repaid by knowing that you are happy. It almost breaks my heart to think of all you have suffered, and I only wish I had known it sooner, as I should have come to your rescue at once. When the old witch had gone away, the princess hid the thread very carefully, and at night she got up very quietly, and with a beating heart she bound the thread round her husband's foot. Just as she was pulling the knot tight, there was a crack, and the thread broke, for it was rotten. Her husband awoke with a start, and said to her, Unhappy woman, what have you done? Three days more, and this unholy spell would have fallen from me. And now who knows how long I may have to go about in this disgusting shape. I must leave you at once, and we shall not meet again, until you have worn out three pairs of iron shoes, and blunted a steel staff in your search for me. So saying, he disappeared. Now when the princess was left alone, she began to weep and moan in a way that was pitiful to hear. But when she saw that her tears and groans did her no good, she got up, determined to go wherever fate would lead her. On reaching a town, the first thing she did was to order three pairs of iron sandals and a steel staff, and having made these preparations for her journey, she set out in search of her husband. On and on she wandered over nine seas and across nine continents, through forests with trees whose stems were as thick as beer barrels stumbling and knocking herself against the fallen branches, then picking herself up and going on. The boughs of the trees hit her face, and the shrubs tore her hands, but on she went and never looked back. At last, wearied from her long journey, and worn out and overcome with sorrow, but still with hope at her heart, she reached a house. And who do you think lived there? The moon. The princess knocked at the door and begged to be let in, that she might rest a little. The mother of the moon, when she saw her sad plight, felt a great pity for her, and took her in and nursed and tended her. And while she was here, the princess had a little baby. One day the mother of the moon asked her, How is it possible for you, a mortal, to get hither to the house of the moon? Then the poor princess told her all that had happened to her, and added, I shall always be thankful to heaven for leading me hither, and grateful to you that you took pity on me and my baby, and did not leave us to die. Now I beg one last favor of you. Can your daughter, the moon, tell me where my husband is? She cannot tell you that, my child, replied the goddess. But if you will travel toward the east, until you reach the dwelling of the sun, he may be able to tell you something. Then she gave the princess a roast chicken to eat, and warned her to be very careful not to lose any of the bones, because they might be of great use to her. When the princess had thanked her once more for her hospitality and for her good advice, she had thrown away one pair of shoes that were worn out and had put on a second pair. She tied up the chicken bones in a bundle, and taking her baby in her arms and her staff in her hand, she set out once more on her wanderings. On and on and on she went, across bare sandy deserts, where the roads were so heavy that for every two steps that she took forward, she fell back one. But she struggled on till she passed these dreary plains. Next, she crossed high rocky mountains, jumping from crag to crag and from peak to peak. Sometimes she would rest for a little on a mountain and then start afresh, always farther and farther on. She had to cross swamps and to scale mountain peaks covered with flints so that her feet and knees and elbows were all torn and bleeding. And sometimes she came to a precipice across which she could not jump and she had to crawl round on hands and knees, helping herself along with her staff. At length, wearied to death, she reached the palace in which the sun lived. She knocked and begged for admission. 
The mother of the son opened the door and was astonished at beholding a mortal from the distant earthly shores, and wept with pity when she heard of all she had suffered. Then, having promised to ask her son about the princess's husband, she hid her in the cellar so that the son might notice nothing on his return home, for he was always in a bad temper when he came in at night. The next day, the princess feared that things would not go well for her, for the son had noticed that someone from the other world had been in his palace. But his mother had soothed him with soft words, assuring him that this was not so. So the princess took heart when she saw how kindly she was treated, and asked, But how in the world is it possible for the son to be angry? He is so beautiful and so good to mortals. This is how it happens, replied the mother's son. In the morning when he stands at the gates of paradise, he is happy and smiles on the whole world. But during the day he gets cross because he sees all the evil deeds of men, and that is why his heat becomes so scorching. But in the evening he is both sad and angry, for he stands at the gates of death. That is his usual course. From there he comes back here. She then told the princess that she had asked about her husband, but that her son had replied that he knew nothing about him, and that her only hope was to go and inquire of the wind. Before the princess left the mother of the son, she gave her a roast chicken to eat, and advised her to take great care of the bones, which she did, wrapping them up in a bundle. She then threw away her second pair of shoes, which were quite worn out, and with her child on her arm and her staff in her hand, she set forth on her way to the wind. In these wanderings she met with even greater difficulties than before, for she came upon one mountain of flints after another, out of which tongues of fire would flame up. She passed through woods, which had never been trodden by human foot, and had to cross fields of ice and avalanches of snow. The poor woman nearly died of these hardships, but she kept a brave heart, and at length she reached an enormous cave in the side of a mountain. This was where the wind lived. There was a little door in the railing, in front of the cave, and here the princess knocked and begged for admission. The mother of the wind had pity on her and took her in, that she might rest a little. Here, too, she was hidden away, so that the wind might not notice her. The next morning, the mother of the wind told her that her husband was living in a thick wood, so thick that no axe had been able to cut away through it. Here he had built himself a sort of house by placing trunks of trees together and fastening them with withes and here he lived alone, shunning humankind. And the mother of the wind had given the princess a chicken to eat, and had warned her to take care of the bones. She advised her to go by the Milky Way, which at night lies across the sky, and to wander on until she reached her goal. Having thanked the old woman with tears in her eyes for her hospitality, and for the good news she had given her, the princess set out on her journey, and rested neither night nor day, so great was her longing to see her husband again. On and on she walked, until her last pair of shoes fell in pieces. So she threw them away, and went on with bare feet, not heeding the bogs, nor the thorns that wounded her, nor the stones that bruised her. At last, she reached a beautiful green meadow on the edge of a wood. Her heart was cheered by the sight of the flowers and the soft, cool grass, and she sat down and rested for a little, but hearing the birds chirping to their mates among the trees made her think with longing of her husband, and she wept bitterly and taking her child in her arms, and her bundle of chicken bones on her shoulder, she entered the wood. For three days and three nights she struggled through it, but could find nothing. She was quite worn out with weariness and hunger, and even her staff was no further help to her, for in her many wanderings it had become quite blunted. She almost gave up in despair, but made one last great effort, and suddenly in the thicket she came upon the sort of house that the mother of the wind had described. It had no windows, and the door was up in the roof. Round the house she went, in search of steps, but could find none. What was she to do? How was she to get in? She thought and thought, and tried in vain to climb up to the door. Then suddenly, she bethought her of the chicken bones that she had dragged all that weary way, and she said to herself, They would not all have told me to take such good care of these bones if they had not had some good reason for doing so. Perhaps now, in my hour of need, they may be of use to me. So she took the bones out of her bundle, and having thought for a moment, she placed the two ends together. To her surprise, they stuck tight. Then she added the other bones, till she had two long poles the height of the house. These she placed against the wall, at a distance of a yard from one another. Across them she placed the other bones, piece by piece, like the steps of a ladder. As soon as one step was finished, she stood upon it, and made the next one, and then the next, till she was close to the door. But just as she got near the top, she noticed that there were no bones left for the last rung of the ladder. What was she to do? Without the last step, the whole ladder was useless. She must have lost one of the bones. Then suddenly an idea came to her. Taking a knife, she chopped off her little finger, and placing it on the last step, it stuck as the bones had done. 
The ladder was complete, and with her child on her arm, she entered the door of the house. Here she found everything in perfect order. Having taken some food, she laid the child down to sleep in a trough that was on the floor and sat down herself to rest. When her husband, the pig, came back to his house, he was startled by what he saw. At first, he could not believe his eyes and stared at the ladder of bones and at the little finger on the top of it. He felt that some fresh magic must be at work, and in his terror, he almost turned away from the house. But then a better idea came to him, and he changed himself into a dove so that no witchcraft could have power over him, and flew into the room without touching the ladder. Here he found a woman rocking a child. At the sight of her, looking so changed by all that she had suffered for his sake, his heart was moved by such love and longing, and by so great a pity that he suddenly became a man. The princess stood up when she saw him, and her heart beat with fear, for she did not know him. But when he had told her who he was, in her great joy she forgot all of her sufferings, and they seemed as nothing to her. He was a very handsome man, as straight as a fir tree. They sat down together, and she told him of all her adventures, and he wept with pity at the tale. And then he told her his own story. I am a king's son. Once, when my father was fighting against some dragons, who were the scourge of our country, I slew the youngest dragon. His mother, who was a witch, cast a spell over me and changed me into a pig. It was she who, in the disguise of an old woman, gave you the thread to bind round my foot, so that instead of the three days that had to run before the spell was broken, I was forced to remain a pig for three more years. Now that we have suffered for each other and have found each other again, let us forget the past. And in their joy they kissed one another. Next morning they set out early to return to his father's kingdom. Great was the rejoicing of all the people when they saw him and his wife. His father and his mother embraced them both, and there was feasting in the palace for three days and three nights. Then they set out to see her father. The old king nearly went out of his mind with joy at beholding his daughter again. When she had told him all her adventures, he said to her, Did not I tell you that I was quite sure that that creature who wooed you and won you as his wife had not been born a pig? You see, my child, how wise you were in doing what I told you. And as the king was old and he had no heirs, he put them on the throne in his place. And they ruled as only kings rule who have suffered many things. And if they are not dead, they are still living and ruling happily. Thank you for listening. I welcome you back anytime you may need to hear a comforting voice or a familiar bedtime story.